Um, and uh, ours has been a very like long haul compared to the Twitters or the Foursquares of the world. We started the site in 2003, um, and we were acquired in 2011 uh, by Match. And um, that gave us a certain curmudgeonly practical aspect. So we've always been sort of resistant to trends. Uh, we don't have an API. Um, in fact, we're, we're, we're well, we're, we're, we're going to have one next year, probably. Uh, and, and my talk is really to explain um, how we arrived at the decision to create one. Um, we, despite our general grouchiness, we, we are a resistance to trends. We, 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 we're all math majors, um, and we were always really uh, analytic people, and, and in data and, and analysis were always two big kind of, um, I guess, tentpole ideas and why we even wanted to start the dating site at the time in like 2003. Basically, it was just like, you're my age, we're close together, uh, we both live in New York, I guess we're a match. Um, that was the vibe on a lot of dating sites, and we thought we could improve that. Um, so I guess, uh, and, and so our, our data started um, as an, an internally as a way to uh, do our jobs better as a dating site, as matchmakers, and then it evolved into an external strategy, and then that has led directly to why we want to create an API, and I, I'll just walk you through that sort of as a test case, I guess. So, so uh, on dating sites, like, you, you, it turns out that one, one of the most important things you, you you do, what you have to do is figure out how attractive everybody is, because otherwise the whole thing explodes, uh, which I'll explain in a little while. So we have, like most dating sites, I don't know how many of you do online dating or don't or whatever, we, we have a way you can rate somebody one to five stars and it's all really good. Uh, and this is how men rate women. This is like the shape, I guess, of, of like female attractiveness on OkCupid. Um, it's kind of boring. It's like a, it's actually pretty close to a normal curve, which in itself is surprising given the sort of media narrative of of how uh, men have unreasonable expectations of women because of porn or whatever advertising or any of these things. Uh, Megan Fox. Uh, so so. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's pretty well centered. The mean is like 2.86, the median is 2.83, very close together, it's pretty well distributed. Um, so that's that. Uh, now, this is how women rate men. So you can see they, they center their votes, their median there is about two, and actually if this is a, a, a a normal curve, that's actually, actually isn't even a normal curve, it's what's called a log normal curve, it's a, sort of a, another story, but they, they, women and men just mathematically, fundamentally have different ways of evaluating each other. Um, so, first of all, this is, and this is, by the way, not because we have unattractive dudes on OkCupid. In fact, we went through, just to like, prove it to ourselves, I ran a 1,000 uh, male profile photos uh, from OkCupid and 1,000 just randomly selected from, from Facebook through Mechanical Turk and had people rate them. It, they came out the same, like, same attractiveness. We have normal guys on OkCupid. It's just that it's the women who, in the sense, are abnorm abnormal. Um, uh, and so this is actually uh, kind of flipped prematurely, but well, whatever. So this is not a problem just on OKCupid. This is like um, a thing that happens on all dating. This is Tinder, uh, which is a kind of newly popular dating app where you vote on people with your thumb left or right. Um, maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. We, uh, we have, a, have an investment in them, so I have their data. Uh, and as you can see, like, m they, they have almost the same curve for the women. It's, on, it's centered a little bit lower off, off what would you call impartial, I guess, but men are completely in the shitter, uh, which is, and, and then even further off, um, this is Date Hookup, a site which we bought, which has just terrible interface problems. It's kind of like a reclamation project for us. They have everything crammed down towards the end, but of course, like men, this, this is like 63% of dudes only get a yes vote 5% or less of the time, which is awful, right? So like, obviously, the closer you can get to the OkCupid okay scenario where the two things are more towards the center, the better your site is. You, you want the guys to think the women are attractive and the women to think the men are attractive uh, by however they set that scale, right? Otherwise, you end up with a really bad situation. Everybody leaves because they don't like each other. Uh, okay, Cupid has a slightly a different problem because they kind of, at least they're close enough, um, they do like each other. Um, and what happens is, is that, that the men, in many ways, like the women too much. They, uh, they, they, they very heavily skew their messages towards the hottest women over there. As you can see, somebody in the, in the, high, in the, in the highest percentile of attractiveness. This is, so this is messages from men to women. This blue line, I'm looking, talking about the blue line. The blue line is like message density, okay? So it's like, I, I, I zeroed it, or I guess one it here. So the ugliest user is set at one, and it goes up to about 200 for the hottest user. So you can see there, it gets much more intense, almost exponentially intense, the more attractive you get. Um, however, 
which is a weird statement on human nature, I guess. Actually, well, you would expect that the red line, which is the reply rate that the women reply back, would be actually the inverse of that blue curve. In a, in a kind of like sensical world, you'd say, well, the ugliest women, like a given woman will only reply kind of once per unit time she's screwing around with the site. And if she gets 250 messages, she's going to reply to one. And if somebody gets only one message, they're going to reply to that one too. And these things would kind of be one over the other. But that's actually not the case. Like the, the lower rated women only reply slightly more often, you know, relatively to expectations than even the hottest women. The, the fact that 20%, like the hottest women uh, reply 20% of the time is actually kind of insane, considering that they get, you know, hundreds, tens to hundreds of times as many messages as everybody else. So, um, which is, on the one hand, a reflection that we're doing our job well, because we're getting these people quality messages that they want to reply to. Um, on the other hand, it creates an unpleasant tension, because uh, from an economic perspective, for men, they're like, well, why should I even bother messaging these people if basically my same chances, I have basically the same chance over here. So you, you, these two things are fighting each other, our desire to make a quality site and deliver quality people, and um, men's uh, instinctive desire like moths to a flame to shatter themselves on the rocks over there. <laughs> so it's these kinds of discussions that we went through uh, internally, uh, you know, all the time. Like this is the kind of, I guess, analysis that you have to do to run a dating site. If you don't do, if you're at least not aware of these things, and, and then obviously you, you have to take, into, take them into account in the UX. If you're not aware, your website is destroyed because all, all of the attractive women get all of the messages. So just consider it on an individual basis. The hottest woman gets, however, 200, 200 messages per. She's like, I can't answer these. Fuck this, I'm leaving. Then, then all, and, and by the way, everyone who wrote her do, doesn't get a reply. So they're all mad. She's mad. She leaves. Then the next woman in line, and the next woman in line. And you end up with this really terrible situation where all the women are leaving because they get too many messages. The men are leaving because they don't ever get any replies. Um, and even now, I mean, as much thought and work as we've put into this problem, which we call the focus problem, um, you know, the, probably the second most common reason for leaving OkCupid after I found someone on OkCupid is I get too many messages. So it's still a problem. It's just a thing that you, it, we're, philosophically, despite the, the kind of like ghost in the machine that we apply to these things, we never block anybody else from seeing anyone's profile. So people will, no matter how we kind of throttle the attractiveness of the people that you see or how we decide behind the scenes who you should be checking out and how we suggest people, people will work around it and do whatever they want to do, which is this. So. Um, Anyway, th this from the very beginning in, in, was extremely important to us. And we built up not only the analytic infrastructure, but the, but the UX infrastructure to collect this data over time. Like, we didn't start out with ratings. Um, we were probably went two years before we had that until we realized that we needed to get a handle on this problem. You know, when you're small enough, things can seem noisy. Trends can seem like noise, and of course, vice versa. So we did that. We built it up. And, 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 and about 2008, we said to ourselves, like, well, this stuff is actually pretty interesting. I mean, whatever, it'll get a chuckle from a crowd. Uh, and, and you can have talk to somebody at a dinner, dinner party about this crazy crap you found on your website. And they're like, whoa, that's so cool. But so, so maybe this is like a PR strategy for us. So we took this data, um, and, and, and we sort of, uh, well, whitewashed isn't exactly the right word. But we sort of like over-aggregated it into the sort of typical Huffington Post-style factoids that you see on the Huffington Post, where it's like, you know, best cities to be single for the Super Bowl and like this kind of garbage that nobody really cares about, but the press will publish anyway. Uh, and we had a PR company. We hired a PR company for, for, for six months, and they were out trying to foist this stuff on people. And it just com fell completely flat because there wasn't any detail. There wasn't any actual data. It was just whatever. One top 10 list is no different from another top 10 list, really, right? It's just a random thing. Well, not random, but a silly thing, at least. So we were like, all right, let, let's let's do something a little different. Let's take this internal data that we've spent so much time figuring out and decided that it's useful and that we've understood to be at least interesting to a, a regular person if you explain it well, maybe with a little bit of humor, and let's just publish it straight out. Like, just take this or all the things that I've just said to you and publish it, which um, is, of course, in retrospect for me, seems like I don't know why we didn't do it earlier. Um, but, you know, there's, there's few companies that I, I think would be comfortable kind of bearing their guts or whatever you want to call it to, to, the, to the public, and especially because a lot of it is very unflattering to the users. Um, but we didn't have a lot to lose at that point. I mean, we were not exactly small, but I wouldn't say successful in, say, 2008 after five years. Um, so we actually turned that exact what I just 
presented to you guys into a blog post. This wasn't the first one, but this is just an example. You know, whatever, your looks in your inbox, and you have some examples, and you talk, this goes down, you know, into these charts and graphs and all this stuff. And it, it was actually wildly successful. Um, here, this is 69,000 Facebook likes, just for, this, just for this particular post, so not just for the blog in Toto, but for, for this particular thing. And, 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 and so we started with things that were uh, intrinsic to our business, like messaging and attractiveness, and we started to fold that stuff out into things that didn't really have anything to do with dating, uh, like, I don't know if you guys can see from there, but the, the top two posts here are about race, um, which of course is kind of a third rail for almost any uh, entity that wants to stay functional and make money. And here, you, you know, there's a 1,500 comments on the top one. We usually turn the comments off after a day just because it was like annoying to approve them. We just wanted some to be there. So they were tremendously successful. About a million people for each one of these uh, read them and they were forwarded around through social media and all of these channels that are so important to everyone. Um, and what happened was, it was extremely good for our business. Uh, this 2009 is when we had our first post in July. You'll notice every January we have a little uptick. Uh, just, that's just people are spending New Year's Eve by themselves, or watching their friends make out, or having their parents ask them when are they going to get married, and they're like, fuck it, I'm going to join a dating site, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> so, you know, we were really flat all through 2008. January 2009, at this point we're actually running out of money. Our runway at this point was like to, I think November of 2009, um, and we had started, we were self-funded, and we had started another company called SparkNotes before this, so we had already been through this rodeo, we had some money, and we, we weren't just like lost in the woods, but obviously you also have to be realistic about what your business is doing. So flat in 2008, 2009 is lurching along, we publish these things, nothing really moves that much, the first few. What ended up happening is these things kind of forward along and become sort of, um, you know, dinner party fodder, basically. And not everybody at that theoretical dinner party needs to join a dating site tonight. Uh, but when they break up with their boyfriend or whoever they're there with or whatever, like, damn, man, I'm single. What? Okay, Cupid. And then they go join Okay, Cupid. And these things worked almost like uh, the billboards in Times Square where the people don't walk past the big Coke display or whatever and are like, oh my God, I'm so thirsty. Where's a Coke? You know, I don't even think you can get one in Times Square anymore. But, they, but they, they just, you know, whatever. It goes into their mind, right? Um, and, and so over time, we published only 15 of these things. Um, and they, they really transformed our business uh, in terms of like the press. We were covered in the Times, we were covered in um, the New Yorker. Uh, we just became synonymous with data in people's mind, and um, it showed that we understood people, which I think is a very important thing to put out there if you're supposing to match them with someone else, right? Like that's our entire business is people. We don't really have like feeds or followers or any of this other crap. We're just trying to get two account holders to go meet in person and get off of OkCupid. So um, this was a transformative strategy for us. Um, and you'll notice there's this sort of uh, interruption there. We, we were bought in January 11 um, by Match. They didn't ask us to stop. In fact, they're so sad that we haven't published since then. Um, and we're still reaping the benefits even now in July of 13. These posts cumulatively get about 100,000 uniques uh, every month, so it it's just kind of keeps on going. And you know, of course your reputation is something that lives on past anything like that, but um, we just had to do other things and I was started working on a book, so we stopped. Um, but then we realized like, shit, it would be awesome to have more of these blog posts, you know, the, the, the black line can always go higher, right? So, um, so how can that happen? I, I don't, me, Christian, I don't have time to do it. We, we're getting um, requests from academics all the time about like, okay, can we, you know, we're trying to do this study, can we do something with your data? And like our databases aren't built, uh, especially because they've been sort of piled one, one on the other, like ruins of an ancient city uh, since 2003. It's just incredibly annoying to go even find out something basic. Um, and we were like, well, what we should do is make an API, not so that people can make apps for OkCupid, like a tweet deck for OkCupid or whatever, although that's also cool. Um, is so that we can give these academics an API key so they can go out and make this stuff, basically these blog posts for us, and get us all the press attention and all of the good stuff that we've gotten through this stuff for ourselves. Uh, get, get it on our behalf and for them and to do their research and all this kind of thing. It's a way to sort of uh, multiply the power of, of our data since we don't have time to really harness it ourselves right now. So it was kind of a process from looking inward to like what do we have on hand to making the decisions that we need to make to like run OkCupid to we're going to expose our data, and then almost a fractal of that exposure where we're going to get a lot of other people to expose it in uh, all these other different times, and that's the goal for, for the OkCupid API, which is a little different than uh, certainly most web companies, um, but it's just one that sort of fits the spirit of what we've been doing in the company. Um, and that's the end of my talk.